Imagine living your life after 50 and feeling energized and excited about your future. Welcome to the Women in the Middle podcast, the podcast for women who are ready to figure out what they want and create the life they deserve. Here's your host and master certified life coach, Susie Rosenstein. Hey there, welcome back to the podcast, Women in the Middle. I'm your host, Susie Rosenstein, and I am so glad to be here with you again for this week's episode, which is another interview in the Getting Real with Women in the Middle series. I love finding amazing women to interview and introduce you to. I met today's guest while visiting my son this summer in Kelowna, British Columbia. I have recently purchased a portable digital recorder to help me out when I'm out and about and I meet amazing people. So stay tuned for some fun ideas coming from all of the new possibilities that this will open up. I have to say, I can't help but have a bit of a funny flashback from grade three at this point. Do you guys remember when you got your first tape recorder? I got mine for my birthday way back in the 70s, and one of my favorite things to do was to make funny commercials with my cousin Bill. Remember the Tidy Bowl Man? In our commercial, we flushed what we called the Tiny Bowl Man (laughs) down the toilet, screaming and recording all the way home. But the thing that was the absolute best thing to record was plain and simple. It was a good old-fashioned fart, (laughs) or dozens of them. Even better. We used to take that recorder. We had this creek, and we used to go up and down the creek I guess we felt kind of like it was private if we were outside and we were just, me and my local neighborhood friends, we were just farting up a storm and recording them and laughing and laughing and laughing. Make sure to send me an email if you remember doing that kind of crazy thing or just let me know what you like to record when a tape recorder was new technology. I guess when you think about it, the groundwork for me to fall in love with podcasting started back then with that joy that came from recording flatulence. Who knew? (laughs) Okay, but I digress. Please, 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 though, send me anything you can about what you love to record when you were a kid. Now, as we got older, making mixtapes of favorite music was super fun to do. Did you throw out all of those cassettes yet, or are they still kicking around in your garage or your basement? I didn't have the heart to throw them out. The art and science of recording has sure come a long way since the 70s. This new little digital recorder is about the size of my phone and will always be in my purse, just in case I run into the most interesting woman in the middle in the world, and I can't resist capturing her brilliance to share with you here in the podcast. Okay, let me tell you what I have for you today. The one thing that my podcast guests all have in common is that they are super cool women our age who have made a big scary change in their lives and are now on the other side of it, so much so that they can reflect and share some amazing advice. This week, my guest is a woman in the middle with a green thumb. Um, My guess, though, now that I'm thinking about it, it's a purple thumb. (laughs) That's because my guest today completely reinvented her family farm. Her name is Andrea McFadden. She went from being a teacher of special education to running a vertically integrated herb farm specializing in lavender. That's how I met her. When I was in Kelowna, my son planned a fun day for us with a few cool places to explore. And one of these places, was a lavender farm. Now I've been to a couple of lavender farms in my day and I wasn't expecting what I saw when I got there. Nothing prepared me for for what was at the other end of that driveway, the way it smelled, what I experienced when we pulled up and got out of the car. It was the Okanagan Lavender Herb Farm. If you love essential oils and gardening combined with a good story about change and falling in love with your career, stay tuned because you are going to love this interview. Hi, Andrea. Welcome to the Women in the Middle podcast. I'm so excited you're here. Hi, Susie. It's nice to see you again. Oh, my gosh. I had the best time meeting Andrea this summer. It was in July. I was visiting my son in Kelowna, British Columbia, where he had an internship. And on the day, uh, one of the days he planned, 
for us to do a few special things. And he knew I would love to come to a lavender farm. So he selected your farm and away we went in a rented car. And there you were. And when we had a chance to talk, I could just tell that there was an interesting story there. So welcome to the podcast. And I just love meeting people when I'm out and about traveling around. It was wonderful to meet you and Zach, Susie, and to hear what you do with your life. And you're probably thinking, who is, why is she asking me all these questions? (laughs) Just buy some essential oil for God's sake. (laughs) (laughs) Which I did and I use it in my diffuser and it is fantastic. Oh, nice. So one of the things I just love about the podcast is the chance to talk to amazing women in the middle like you who've done something really different in their life that was not plan A. So so let's talk about that. Can you tell us a little bit about what was going on in your 40s? Well, I guess let's even go back before that. So you started out as in special education. I did. I started out as a teacher of special education and worked in early intervention for and a long time before we started our family. And then, um, and then we moved up to an old family farm where we are right now. And that was in the 90s. So where, and, where did you start your work? Where were you living? And then where was the family farm? Because this podcast goes to people around the world. So let's talk a little bit about geographically, what are we talking about? Okay, so my, my grandfather came to Canada. He came to Kelowna, British Columbia in 1908. And he started a nursery business. And nurseries needed a lot of land to operate. So we actually live on one of the farm parcels from that nursery business that was started in the uh, early 1900s. Wow. And then so you had farming in your family for quite some time. I did. We had lots of um, experience learning to farm, Um, volunteer experience and paid experience also doing things for uh, my dad growing up. So I, you know, farming sort of gets in your blood and they, and you really do need your family to help you with the farm. It's, It's so much physical work. Right, right. But you decided to become a teacher and not go into farming at the beginning, right? I did because I didn't think I wanted to do that with my life. So I, did, I went off to Nova Scotia, and I studied special education at Acadia. And then I came back to BC, and I really actually loved my uh, work with children and learned a lot, you know, learned about working with visually impaired children and children with hearing impairments and learned a lot of sign language. And it was always challenging. There was always something new to learn. But then we took sort of 10 years off when we started our family. And at the end of that, we came back full circle and uh, we're living on a farm again. And and then it poses the question, like, who's going to farm it? I see. So it was the family, raising your family, that that's the reason you took a break from your career? It was. Yes. We had, we had three children in four years, so it was a little busy for a while. Oh my gosh, we're in the same situation. <laughs> I don't. Re- my kids are always asking me, "Tell me stories from when I was little." I'm like, I don't remember much. It was pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah, I, I know exactly what's that. What that is like. So you took a break, um, but then what? What's the reason that you moved back um, to British Columbia from Nova Scotia? That's a cross country move. So what? What happened there? Yeah, you know what? I loved Nova Scotia, but I graduated in 1983, which maybe you remember was not a great time to be going into the workforce. There weren't a lot of jobs. Um, And so I came back. Actually, I went to Victoria first because that's where I got a job. And I was in Victoria for a year before I came back to Kelowna. All right. So how old were you when you found yourself back in Kelowna? Oh. I guess I was um, 20, I must have been 23. Wow, okay. So then what happened? Then I got this great job at this child development center and married my husband. Um, 
and we, he was studying still, you know, we did, I guess, um, four years of working and built a couple of houses to try and build up some capital. And then he finished his accountant uh, designation and we started a family. Okay. So then you started the family, you decided to take a break from your career. And then about 10 years into that, you started to think about what you wanted again professionally. So what was that like? Right. So actually, you know, what happened was the economy had gone into another dive. And my husband's company um, was in a community where they'd done a lot of development and it was hit really hard in the recessions. And his hours were cut back. So I decided that I would go back to teaching. And you kind of have this 10-year window with your credentials where you can apply to be reinstated. So I, I went through that with the BC Teachers Federation. And uh, they came back and said that I, I would be reinstated, but I had to go back and do first-year math. You're kidding me. <laughs> and I thought, really? <laughs> I, you know, it was one of those turning points because I looked at it and thought, what does math have to do with my profession? I, I mean, of course, you use math every day, but I would have been happy to go back and do all sorts of courses. But first-year math wasn't big on my priority list. It just sounds kind of ridiculous and maybe even a little insulting. I was. I, I was a bit insulted. And of course, sometimes when you're insulted, you make other decisions. <laughs> so the point we were at was this farm that we were living on was actually an apple orchard that was at the end of its lifespan and had to be replanted. So, so because of that ruling, I, um, I decided not to go back into teaching. And we decided let's see what we can do with this property and can we make this farm economically viable so it's only eight acres um and at the time the ministry of agriculture was really encouraging people with smaller properties to go into vertically integrated agriculture and what does that mean that means you grow something you process it into a finished product and you sell it as well. So you've eliminated the middleman. Oh my gosh, I thought it had something to do with plants that grow high. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what is she talking about? <laughs> so it's really everything. You start with the seed, and then you actually sell in some retail capacity, or I guess it might even be a wholesale capacity. Sure, yeah, it could be wholesale. Or um, like originally, I used to go to the farmer's market. I, had a, I have a Volkswagen van and I would pile my three kids into it and off we'd go to the farmer's market. You know, at six in the morning, they weren't always happy with their mother. But <laughs> This sounds kind of scary to me, I have to say. I mean, I know you had farming in your family, but how risky did this seem to you or did it not seem risky at all? Actually, you know, the year that I did the farmer's market, was probably before farmers markets were really popular and I realized that we were we couldn't do that it wasn't going to give us enough of an income to even warrant going down there and the other thing was um well Susie you've been to the farm so you know how beautiful our location is oh my god it is it's actually breathtaking it is breathtaking. It is. And so I realized down at the farmer's market when I stood on an asphalt parking lot under a white tent with everybody else, how could I convey the, how beautiful our farm was and where we grow things without bringing people to the farm? So, yeah, and it's quite like you have to go up a mountain to get to this farm. So the view is stunning. Like it's a vista. I don't think I've ever used the word vista before, but it really is. It's just, it's breathtaking. I, I, I don't know how else to explain it, but I'll definitely, um, well, we're, we're going to include links to your website and everything at the end. So there'll be some pictures there, but yeah, it is, it is a stunning location. And that contrast you just made with, with a parking lot farmer's market with the actual experience of being at the farm, not to mention the, um, 
the smells of the farm and the way the lavender, oh, I don't want to jump the gun here, but just the way that you can just smell nature and, and growth and it just smells so alive. It's spectacular. I, I, I totally agree. I think, um, are you familiar with the term forest bathing in Japan? No, but that sounds amazing. So in, in Japan, and I guess um, probably the people in the big cities, they, they go out into the forest and they spend time in nature and experience all those aromas of nature. And I think that's what I, I felt we needed to convey to people up here. Is it's, it's not just something in a bottle or inside a package. It's something, you know, that is tangible and beautiful. And so how do we, how do we convince people that's what we do? So hence, we started on this journey to bring people up to our farm. And what were you growing at that time? So in the beginning, because my um, family was still in agriculture and also in the wine business, so we pulled out our apple trees in 1993, I guess, in the fall of 1993. And then we planted six acres of grapes for the winery. And we had these long rows of lavender that ran parallel to our road um, and, a, and another block on a lower piece of the property. And we had this little apple picker's cabin that was a cottage my dad had moved up here. And we turned it into a little commercial kitchen and retail shop, tiny, like 12 by 16, I think. That's where we started. Oh my gosh, that's so romantic. <laughs> I have this, just the most romantic uh, view of what you were doing at that time. And to me, it really does seem like it needs a lot of courage to go from a pretty traditional income and career where you could pretty much understand how much you could make if you took the stupid math course to something where you had the property and you had a family history of successful farming. And also, well, the Kelowna, I did not know this about your area, but fruit packing is uh, really what the land is known for. And so I didn't understand this at all, but fruit is a big deal in Kelowna. And so there you were with your grapes your family history, your land, and a little bit of lavender. And to me, that sounds romantic, but scary as hell. But that method that we were in then, Susie, that was fairly safe still because we grew grapes and we harvested them and we sold them to the winery and we knew the formula that was being used for what, um, we, what kind of income we would get from those grapes. Oh, that's a good point because wine, wine is very special in that part of British Columbia too. So you were in a, a, a field, no pun intended, that was well known for winemaking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were. And of course, you know, when you grow grapes, it's based on your tonnage and it's based on your sugar levels. And those are impacted by the weather. And um, so... We have this interesting location here that has these stunning views of the lake, but we also get this wind that comes off the lake and hits our property full force. Oh, um, what's the lake called? Okanagan Lake. Ah, okay. I couldn't remember. Beautiful. Yeah. It's but beautiful windy. All right. Good point. So in 2008, when we didn't have any snow we got very cold temperatures and we got lots of these winter winds and it just devastated our vineyard. And so then we were back, that was sort of, we'd done this for 10 years. Now we were back at square one again because we either had to replant our vineyard or maybe it was time to just pull, pull out the grapes and grow lavender because we were having more success with the, the lavender in terms of the weather, it wasn't as impacted as the grapes were. That's so interesting, but you didn't have nearly the commitment to lavender. You just had some growing on the perimeter of a portion of the property. But still, even with that limited amount, you were able to see something. Right. And, then, and also an, an interest. Um, and I guess in 2008, Maybe we, our three children were helping us more, so we had more workers. 
Love those but, workers. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a, actually, I think, um, I don't think it was scary when I decided to not go back into teaching. It was scary when we decided to pull out the grapes and build the building that houses our farm today because we took out a mortgage for the building and we hadn't borrowed any money to do anything until that point. So that really kept me up a lot at night. That's very interesting that it was the mortgage with the bank versus the, the strategic business plan for the land. Right. I know. You know, I never had any doubt that we could do it. I just, um, I just worried. I worried because I, I don't like that. So that was a, that was a hard thing for me. Hmm. And how, I know like what you're really doing is you've, you've gone back. So you went back to BC, you went back to family property, you went back to an actual family farm, you went back to a rich history of farming in your family. And was that weighing on you a little bit that you really, I don't know, wanted to make it successful um, in terms of preserving something, uh, a family history? Oh, absolutely. I think, um, well, I don't come from a competitive family, but I come from a family um, that I think has a lot of pride in what they do in the Okanagan. And so it was really, it was really, really important for me to be successful at agriculture. It's so interesting to me. Like, so you started out as a teacher and then you really did a full circle going back to your roots. Again, there's so many puns here. I'm so sorry. It's so (laughs) corny with all the puns. Okay. So now you've got your eyes on lavender. So then what happened? Because apple orchard to grapes to lavender, that's a little different in many, many ways. For sure. And especially um, today, because I think probably the most surprising thing for me is we've ended up working in tourism um, by default. Uh, because when people visit a new area, they like, they like to go out and do things. And just like how you found us, Susie. Um, Classic. Yeah. You, yeah. I mean, you meet wonderful people from all over the world. Um, but the basis of what we do remains the same, that we are growing all these ingredients to make all these products to sell in our shop and, and in our online store and, and also to some wholesale accounts. Um, and what did you think you'd be doing with the lavender? You said tourism was a bit of a surprise. What did you think originally your business would look like with that shift? You know, when we first started, I actually sold more to chefs and restaurants than as individuals also, but a lot of chefs used our things in the beginning. Um, now today, we don't sell very often to chefs because I think so many of them have, have their own gardens, um, make things in their own kitchens. Um, so... Sometimes when I look at it, I think, how did we end up here? And then I remember that it's really been this 20-year journey. And every year would present a challenge. And then we would figure out how to deal with it over the winter. And we would start the next season. And, of course, every year has a challenge. So you're always evolving and, and changing to meet that requirement. Yeah, that really reminds me about another guest I had on a couple of weeks ago. Her name was Rose Schmidt. And she talked, she ended up quitting um, a job. She was five years from retirement uh, in a school district, a school system as a psychology associate. And she quit without a plan. And she said, in hindsight, one of the things that made it possible for her to find the inspiration, motivation, and courage to keep moving forward, to find her way back to a career path, was not having strict Um, rules and guidelines and time commitments. So that really reminds me about what you're saying in terms of every year, things are a little different and they're going to um, need creative solutions. And that's just part of the way you're moving forward now, rather than having a completely predictable business and a completely predictable business plan. Oh, Susie, that's so true. And even in small things like... um, 
we blend teas here and a lot of our teas have spearmint in them. And so we grow enough spearmint to create our teas. But last year, the tea sales really took off unexpected. And we all of a sudden had to real, um, look at where we could plant more spearmint on the property. Um, because that's, we can't pick up the phone and order the spearmint from someone else. We have to produce it ourselves. So um, I actually don't mind things like that coming that's at a, me. That's a great problem to have. And I guess uh, I'm just grinning my face off because I just love your story so much. <laughs> uh, and I and I have all these secret um, ideas about what I might be doing in retirement, and I it always has to do with farming in, of some sort or uh, having alpacas. Or I discovered recently Nigerian dwarf pigs. Uh, no, Nigerian <laughs> dwarf goats. Because I'm fascinated <laughs> with scent and goat's milk soap and all of that. But um, lavender is absolutely one of my favorite scents. And I think one of the other things that must have helped your business is the explosion of the essential oil business. Oh, my gosh. And almost in a scary way how that has exploded. Um, you know, it's so readily available today that um, we, we actually teach an aromatherapy class. Oh, wow. Very regularly to teach people about the safe use of essential oils because... Because people can buy these anywhere, but they don't understand they can be dangerous if you don't use them properly. So we developed a program. It has become really popular, and we love teaching it. So when people do our aromatherapy course, they learn to do something with dried herbs, something with the um, botanical waters that we distill, and something to do with the essential oils that we distill. And um, so we... When that started happening, I think we had to look at how can we participate in this interest in essential oils, but do it in a um, responsible way. Oh, I love that. And I love how you're just responding to opportunity and need as you're growing your business. Again, a pun. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the one thing that I want to mention is just what I experienced when we drove up to the front of your retail outlet, at which also has the, um, the lab is right there, which kind of surprised me. So we pulled into the parking lot and all of a sudden you could see, remember, we're kind of high up on a mountain with this beautiful vista looking over uh, another, the lake, the Okanagan Lake, and then another mountain. So it's just absolutely beautiful. We saw a few deer on our drive up. And then we got out of the car and we were surrounded by this amazing aroma of lavender. There was lavender everywhere growing, bees buzzing around happily. It was just delightful. I just can't even tell you how happy I was. Plus, you have a purple car that was parked right in the driveway that must promote your business. I'm just, I just got so, I was just delighted by all of it. And then we go into the store. And it looked, you know, like a, a, a very laid back retail store. And then to the right, you could see through these windows, it looked like a chemistry lab. And I'm like, wow, this is serious business. This is just not perfumey lavender. This is some serious business. And then the, the lighting and windows are so beautiful. And you go to the back of the store and that is where you go onto this balcony and you can see the beautiful fields of lavender again, with the lake and the, and the mountains behind it. So it's just, and you could, it just smells so amazing. And it reminded me of The Secret Garden, that book from our childhood. It was just the most magical. It was magical, Andrea. It was I, that's magical. one of my favorite books, Susie. Is it really? Oh my I God. love that. Francis that's what it Hodgson reminded Burnett. me. I'm sorry? It's Francis Hodgson Burnett, The oh, Secret Garden. That's right. It was just, it was magical. So oh. I, I love that it was so serious. And then this beautiful woman comes out to meet us and she totally looks like a farmer. She's got on her rubber boots. And, and my son had some questions about cooking with lavender and you took such time with him. I was just impressed with the whole thing. And I spent way more money than I thought I was going to spend. And I have been enjoying the lavender essential oil in my diffuser ever since I came home. I love it. 
Oh, I hope it's helping you sleep. Oh, it's fantastic. <laughs> It's so good. So I just, like I said, I just love your story. And one of the things that I find so important in these interviews is for you to just take a second and talk about what lessons you learned from the whole experience of training to go into one profession, um, having a family, deciding that you wanted a change for whatever reason, your change was, your reason was so interesting, and then taking a deep breath and making a big move in your career, in where you decided to live, and going back to the family farm, and then pursuing a completely different career direction. So what did you learn, the big giant lessons that might be able to um, help other women in the middle who are looking for that same courage? So I think, I think the fear of change governs so many lives. And I think I see it more now with social media also. I think I, I know, we have so many young people come and visit our farm that tell us they're suffering from anxiety and they can't sleep. And I hear all these stories and I think, oh my goodness. Sometimes you have to dig so deep to have the courage to change your path because honestly, if I had stayed in teaching, I would have had you know, most of my weekends off, I would have had nice summer holidays. I, th- those are things that never happened to me. Um, my husband and I have learned to enjoy the opportunity to take a holiday in November when it's not busy. And um, you have to be able to adjust your thinking. Um, you know, my husband grew up with two parents who were teachers. So he had to get over this hump of we work all summer long. Mm. So it is, it's different, um, but it's rewarding. And I think when you're following your passion, even, even once we made the decision to go completely into lavender and the other herbs that we grow, we still will have things happen to us. Like we'll lose a block to cold weather. Uh, and have to replant it. And those are unexpected things that are going to come at you. But I think if you remember to always have your end goal in mind um, and focus on that, that it makes it a little bit easier. And I think you should surround yourself with people who support you. Because we have had an amazing network of friends who have um, helped us through harvest, they've helped us through. Um, one of our children uh, became quite ill and had to go to children's hospital. And it was in the middle of, we just had some plants arrive and our friends and family while we were at the hospital came and planted everything that needed to be planted. So I think support is a huge thing. And, um, and then to, to remember to take pleasure in, the pleasure that you bring other people because I think um, that's what we do for a lot of people here and bring them a little bit of joy in their life we have in our garden a wishing tree when people go into the garden they add a thought or a wish to the tree and sometimes at night my husband and I go and read them and when you're really busy and you get to those low points where you think, why did I choose to do this with my life? I'm working 14 hour days and I never get a break. And then you read someone's wish on the tree that says something like, you know, I hope on this holiday, my family um, recovers from the loss of a child, or I hope that I am able to conceive a baby or how many wishes we have today that say, I just hope for peace. Wow. Um, I, th- I think that those little things encourage you along. And no matter what you do, you're going to have low points in your career. And you're going to have challenges. And you're going to have days when you're just doing what has to be done. But I, I try really hard to not let those detract from the things that I really love to do. Oh, those are such important messages. and. Thank you so much for sharing, though. The wishing tree is just such a beautiful uh, way to get people to really connect to your garden. And I think, 
you know, what you said at the beginning about always having your end goal in mind. And that really is the core of regret proofing. And I talk so much about regret proofing your life and thinking about ways that you don't want to have regrets when it comes to your career, your relationship with others, your self care relationship to yourself. And that's really about end goal, you know? You have to really decide what you want on purpose. That is an end goal. And then ask yourself how you're going to do it. But don't ask yourself how before you've given your, yourself a chance to dream. If you would have asked yourself how you're going to have a successful lavender farm when you were a teacher, it would not have happened. It wouldn't. It just would have I, been too crazy and too weird. It definitely would have. And I would have had too many people tell me that would never work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. All those people. Exactly. So I love that uh, your story of the way you changed your business and, and came back to your roots and everything, it just really shows it's kind of in line with the planting cycle of growth and change and time and not rushing things that uh, sometimes you just have to go with the flow a little bit. And, and you did that. And your approach to problems as working in someone who works in agriculture, it's such a refreshing look on obstacles and strategies, you know? You have an obstacle and then you figure out how to develop a strategy to overcome the obstacle. And yours are related to planting seasons and weather and some other, you know, others of us have problems and obstacles that are on different cycles. But it's just important to go with the flow and know that you cannot have all the answers at the same time, all the time. It's impossible. And to expect it is really discouraging and can drown out a lot of um, dreams. Oh, Susie, I agree. And you know, one of the things that I I learned to do was to look at what my strengths were, because our business grew from this little tiny operation into something where I ended up managing people. And managing people was n not my strength. I just did it because I had to. So I had to look really hard at what my skill set was and what did I do really well and where did I need to hire people to support my weaknesses because I couldn't do everything and I think sometimes with people that do things in an entrepreneurial spirit you have this need to do everything yourself um, and you can't so even things that I have had to give up because, not because I wasn't good at them, because, but because I didn't have time for them. And then I would look at somebody doing something that I would like to do, and I would think, hmm, I don't know if I'd do that that way. And I, would, I have this mantra in my head where I say to myself, well, you don't have time to do it. And they're doing it the way they think it should be done. And so you don't get to have an opinion on that, Andrea. So get doing what you need to do. And I do that all the time. Um, that's, that's beautiful mindfulness right there in action. Because if you continued to allow yourself to think that way, you'd probably be aggravated. Oh, I know. And you know, there's more than one way to, to do things. So you, you have to accept that. And um, and so we've, I think, built a really great team here, and um, we all have different strengths. And, and then you try to channel people into working through those strengths that they have. That's, that's so great. I've actually interviewed somebody on the podcast who is an expert in helping you identify your strengths, and that is such an important message that we can't be amazing at everything, and it makes more sense to stay in your zone of genius and contribute that way. And the one other, the last question I want to ask you before we tell people how to absolutely find your lavender is the other thing that strikes me about your, your transition was that your original career was incredibly social and your new career is much more solitary. And I'm just wondering if you can comment on that. Hmm, that's a, that's a really good comment, Susie. And, I, and I, I am the kind of person happy in my own time. Even when I was studying at university, I had to go off into a cubbyhole and have no distractions because I really need to focus on what I'm doing. 
and so I guess when I'm when I'm out there, I do get to focus on single tasks. Um, yeah, so <laughs> that's a good comment. Well, it sounds I, like you enjoy it. You know, I really do. I really enjoy it. I would have to say that you kind of, in our business anyway, going from small to, I mean, we're still a small business, but we're not minuscule anymore. And we have quite a number of staff. And then we have responsibilities, you know, to our community, things that we take on to support our community. And for instance, we helped Shoebank Canada on Saturday night with a big event. And what is that? Shoe Bank Canada is their goal is to get shoes on everybody who needs them in Canada. And they had an event called My Canvas Has Laces, where they had artists come and paint these Converse high top running shoes. And we went to the event serving Italian sodas for the for the guests who were there. Now that's a really social event. And I actually find those a little difficult for me to go to. So two of our younger staff went and they did it. And I think that, again, comes to, you know, knowing your strengths, knowing I, it's not that I couldn't do an event and I, and I could do it well. I know I could. It's just that it's not, it's not the best place to put me. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense. And um, I've also, now that I work for myself and, and uh, I call myself a home dweller. I talk to lots of people on the phone, my clients, I connect with them on the phone and, and through webcam, like we're talking now. Um, but basically, I'm a home dweller. It's me, my dog, my bird. And <laughs> I like getting out and about, but I'm very happy with the majority of my time working like this, which kind of surprised me because I worked for a very large organization for almost 20 years. So I guess the, the thing to take from that is that sometimes we learn things about ourselves, even at our age. <laughs> and I love that. I love that it's always, uh, we're just always learning. So I'm sorry, I, I just thought of one more question to ask you before we, we give the website. The last question is, um, if you could just share a fun fact about lavender. Most of us are familiar with lavender. And you said earlier on that sometimes we can, uh, we really need to understand how to use essential oils because if we consume them, they can be dangerous. There's something to learn there. But what's something spe very specific about lavender that's a fun fact? Hmm. Um, oh my gosh, there's so many. Um, <laughs> I, you know, okay, well, I, and off the top of my head, the one that comes to mind is what? 80% of our customers say when they walk through the door, I thought there was only one lavender. And there's over 400 different lavender cultivars. So, oh my gosh. I also thought there was one. <laughs> I know. So that is kind of a fun fact. Um, and then oh. someone, someone asked me the other day, and it made me laugh because I'd never heard this before. Was lavender indigenous to the Okanagan? And I said, oh, no. <laughs> but... Um, but, you know, it comes from France and Italy, North Africa, sort of that Mediterranean region. But lavender grows all over the world because it's so adaptable. Ah, uh, okay. That's actually what I was just going to ask, if any, uh, any lavender was um, indigenous to Canada. And it, the answer is no. No, it isn't. That's fascinating. Oh, my gosh. All right. So I'm sure that we have some people listening right now who can't wait to check out your website. So. How can people get in touch with you and your shop? So our website is okanaganlavender.com. And lavender is spelled with an E-R, not an A-R like calendar. Um, oh, good tip. Yeah, so it's Okanagan, O-K-A-N-A-G-A-N, lavender, L-A-V-E-N-D-E-R.com. And of course, I'll have the website on the show notes. Anything else you want to promote? Um, well, Susie, I think that your listeners and visitors should check back with us for something really exciting that we're doing, that we're going to be launching the first week of December. 
Ooh, it looks like a, it's like a two inch round container with a screw top. It is. And, and it's biodegradable. Okay. There's going to be an unveiling. So check out Andrea's website, okanaganlavender.com. Andrea, you've been an absolute delight. I am fascinated with farming. I am fascinated with essential oils. And lavender just makes the world go round. Your story is really compelling. And I just love your bravery. Thank you so much for joining us on Women in the Middle. Oh, my gosh, Susie. Absolutely my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Amazing story, right? So many of my clients struggle to figure out their true passion and feel like something's missing or off when it just remains a mystery. Andrea reconnected with her passion. She always loved the land. She was deeply connected to her family farm. And now that she's gone back to it, she has completely fallen in love with her second career. It's probably the same for you. There are clues to what you really, really, really love back in your childhood. I'm a strong believer in this. What brought you joy as a kid will most likely bring you joy again as a woman in the middle. You don't always have to incorporate what you learn about your past and what you loved into your actual career, though. Sometimes this awareness will bring you more fulfillment to your life, your hobbies, and your relationships. Whatever the case, look for clues. You owe it to yourself to regret-proof your life and experience joy like this as much as possible. If you like what you've heard, just head over to the Women in the Middle podcast on iTunes and leave me a review. Check out the show notes with more information and links at www.susierosenstein.com. And as we're nearing the end of this week's episode, I want you to think about something really important. Do you know where you want to be this time next year? Really allow yourself to think about it. It's so important to give yourself time to think and reflect about what you want going forward. Do you want to be in the same place with all the same feelings about being stuck in a preoccupation with focusing on what you can't do instead of what you can do? If you are not totally stuck, are you ready to grow and do something serious about it? You owe it to yourself to really think this through. Ask yourself, do you wish you could actually fall in love with your life, especially now at your age? I have to tell you, I am pretty excited about my new one-year coaching experience aimed at helping you focus on just this. It is called the 50 Unplugged Mastermind. It is perfect for you when you're ready to finally put your own needs on the priority list for a change. It's all about celebrating opportunity. It's about unplugging from the stigma and stereotypes about what you can't do because of your age and confidently focusing on what you can do regardless of how old you are. It's about being way more intentional about your life so you don't have regrets. Nobody else will do this for you. It's about possibility, growth, excitement, and freedom. How great is that? And the best part is that you get to be part of an amazing community of women who want the same damn thing. (laughs) Learn more about this unique and totally fun year-long coaching experience for women who are turning 50 or in their 50s, or even 50-ish, and are committed to getting excited about their lives again. You have waited long enough, my friend. It is time to celebrate opportunity in your 50 unplugged life. Go ahead and apply already. I'm waiting to see your application. Just go to www.talktosusie.com. Book your 10-minute call to see if we are a good fit. It's free and there's no obligation. You really can create the life that you've always wanted. Seriously, don't waste another minute and just get your application in. There are limited spots and there's bonuses for signing up this month. Can't wait to see your name in my calendar. Let's do this, ladies. One amazing opportunity at a time. Thanks so much for listening.